the thing I saw. Uh, yeah, um, that's uh, a good way to describe that movie. Is the thing to see. There we go. <laughs> Monday I've ever had. Wow. I mean, insofar as it's the one that I'm having right now. Of all the recent Mondays. Yeah. Of all the Mondays I've had today, this one. Let me tell you. Great energy. We're bringing some real hot energy to these mm-hmm. shows. Uh, I was just enjoying my handiwork. I decided to, to do a little uh, poop stirring on on Twitter today. I've been trying to think of what was a good political nonsense question that would get people like riled up. Like, despite the fact that it really meant nothing. Mm-hmm. And so, after long crafting, I, I, I launched, is Obama a top 15 president? Oh, geez. <laughs> uh, hey, re- uh, real quick, Justin, you're, you're getting a little bit of duckage, and we're getting room tone from uh, Andrew. So I don't know if each of you guys uh, can... It's actually coming from Justin. Uh, uh, check, check, check. One, two, three, and I can... Check, check, check. How's that? Any good? Coming in a little hot, to be honest. Um, how about that? I mean, how about that? Oh, wait. No, like, I, all sorry, I know is I can hear uh, uh, the mixer was Andrew breathing up. and not hear well, Justin's words. <laughs> okay. But also, the mixer. Talk again, everybody. Like, sorry. Hey, what's going on? Is the talking and a talking and a flocking, flocking and a rocking. Cool, Andrew. Hi, I'm Andrew. I'm talking out my mouth. A little, little more, please. <laughs> I'm going to keep talking until you tell me to shut my mouth. Shut my mouth. Shut my mouth. I'm not shutting my mouth. <laughs> I hope this is live in front of everybody so they can see how professionals <laughs> do it. Thank you. I rather like it. <laughs> Bri, can you give me some? Yeah, here we go. Man, I'll give you audio. I'll, t- I'll talk pretty much the way I, I talk, give or take. I mean, you know, it's, it can't be held accountable to... Be 100% accurate. Right. I mean, after all, who really knows how they talk? Cool. 
I'm okay. sorry. Brian's voice keeps coming out of his mouth. <laughs> and it won't stop. It just keeps on going. Cool. Well, I am good over here. So anyway, yeah. Is Obama a top 15 president? Because literally, who has their favorite presidents mapped out to 15? Nobody. Right? right? And yet people, immediate opinions. Oh, really? Uh, let oh, me guess. God, are, yeah. are those along predictable uh, dividing lines? Yeah, because the, 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 the sass of it, the stank on it, is that like either you don't think <laughs> that he's in the top 15 or you really want to think about it or you're, like, uh, you're upset that it's like, well, why 15? Top five, top one. Like, <laughs> so <laughs> that's pretty good. That's pretty good as an ad antagonistic tool because, you know, every, everyone who's saying yes probably would have made it, like you said, top one. And everybody yeah. saying no probably would have put him last place. <laughs> last forever. The worst. Also, we're into ranking presidents now, which like is another just assumption that nobody's done. Nobody's been like, all right, bar bar chat. Top five presidents, dog. Where you at? That's great. I uh, and also it's one of those things like you know, fifteen. The, to rank fifteen implies to have knowledge of more than three. exactly. <laughs> like nobody fucking knows. Uh any hoot. Don't pollute. That's what I say. Yeah. So I'm just not getting enough discussions about the Logan Act, so, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Are we, uh... <clears throat> How are we looking, Bryce? Uh, I continue to be ready to go. Oh, great. So, let's go. You good, Andrew? Oh, we cannot hear you. No, I, I, I just mimed it. <laughs> uh, yeah. You good to go then? Should have a conversation sometime about pathological liars. I think we already did. Ooh. That's it not true. Great. That. <gasps> well, I had the most interesting discussion yesterday about that logical. Sorry, I was made some great points. It was really, really good. It's good. And I talked to my friend John Lovitz about this. Uh oh. Pick up that name. Yeah. And his wife, Morgan Fairchild. <laughs> mm -mm, that's the ticket. Yeah. I don't actually know John Lovitz. I'd like to. Yeah, funny. yeah. Yeah, that was such a great character, the liar. I knew a guy like that in high school. Oh, really? Yeah, he went off to like, he was like, oh, yeah, I mean, he went to Universal. He's like Universal Studios, but like in Orlando. He's like, yeah, I'm working here. Yeah, Shane Black, they're editing the, the trailer for Lethal Weapon 3. I got I to gotta work on that. I'm like, oh, cool. And I literally go to Universal Studios, and he's there selling tickets at the ticket booth. Oh, <laughs> like, Awesome. Like, wow, the editing room looks different than I expected. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, I, I think we're all waiting on you for the go there, Andrew. Oh, I need a count in. Okay. Then, all right. Go ahead in three, two. Welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Maine, joined by Brian Brushwood. Oh, you thought I wouldn't have swallowed my drink in time, but guess what? I did. I'm speaking in complete sentences and everything. You're a pro, Justin Robert Young. Hi, friends. <laughs> and we're produced by Mr. Bryce Castillo, who really is the thread that holds this tattered garment together. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Do you hear that? You're a tattered garment thread. <laughs> well, I think, but I think that makes you the tattered garment. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Uh, so, uh, last week it was like an amazing, awesome episode. One of our best ever, really. I'm not sure why it was that was so made it so great. You know, it's because we we stuck to our core strengths. People say don't veer too far outside of your core strengths, and 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 we didn't. Mm -hmm. what? Uh, I, guys, I was I wasn't on the show. Oh, so that means you're not even qualified to weigh in on how awesome last week's episode was. You weren't even here. Yeah, 
I mean, I heard it was spotty. A lot of people are, <laughs> many people are oh, saying. Oh, is, is that what people are saying? <laughs> many people are saying that it was not as good as what uh, the hype. It, it just, was, just forward those tweets and those emails to us. <laughs> yeah, no. Was, was it a bit of a tattered it garment? It wasn't a top 15 episode. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah and one of the things we talked about i think it was in after things we talked about the idea of leveling up and how to like really like push things even further than before mm -hmm. right uh brian says yes andrew that's what we discussed sorry uh, yes that, that that's exactly what i was thinking because <laughs> yeah, one person here has no idea what we talked about so we mentioned that well fun fact uh Friday night, one of our favorite topics about leveling up, Mr. Elon Musk, uh, he'd been teasing for a while when they launched the Falcon Heavy that there was going to be a mystery payload on board. Now, when he launched the first Dragon, the Dragon is the space capsule that goes on top of the Falcon rocket, and it's what my hat is named for. When he launched the first Dragon, they didn't want to put any precious cargo on board because in case it went explodey, you know, he didn't want to have to go, whoopsie, sorry, NASA. So we put a special secret cargo on it, and that turned out to be a giant wheel of cheese, right? <laughs> which was, let us know, yes, uh, the our real-life Tony Stark, crazy billionaire eccentric genius really is eccentric and put a giant wheel of cheese on there, and he is insane, which is awesome. So Friday... I think it was Friday night, whatever, he tweeted out, like, hey, yeah, Falcon Heavy launch, you know, still scheduled for, we're trying to get that going January, etc. Uh, and uh, he announced the cargo. And let me, I'm just going to read the tweet um, from Mr. Musk, and uh, I'm just going to stall here as I wait for it to load. <laughs> well, oh, you already have this? And, and, and by the way, to give a, a personal context for this, I, I saw that you called me on, I want to say this is Friday, um and and I wasn't available and then you're like look at his tweets and so I I did and I couldn't not make this a joke uh that he tweeted out that 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 number 1 you know Falcon Heavy will be next month and part of that is my own fault because in my mind it's always Falcon Heavy we've talked about it so long it's always a someday goal but then to suddenly well, see it no 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 it's next month and then to follow up with this outrageous tweet that says Payload will be my midnight cherry Tesla Roadster playing Space Oddity. Uh, destination is Mars orbit. We'll be in space for a billion years or so if it doesn't blow up on ascent. Like, what about that does not sound like somebody's joking with you? A guy known for late night ambient tweeting. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> well, yeah, I mean, that was all of a sudden, you know, way to, you know, Usually, you know, if you want to bury news, do it on Friday. But if you're Elon Musk, you know, if you want to make news, do it on Friday, whatever, cause a controversy. So he announces this plan. This is what it's going to do. And then immediately people are like, well, wait, is this crazy Elon? Is this is this ambient Elon Musk or is this for reals Elon Musk? And, you know, there's Elon Musk like, I hate traffic. I'm going to dig. We need a faster form of transportation. This thing called hype, you know, Hyperloop. Yeah, 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 whatever. Well, now billions of dollars have been committed and put into making Hyperloop a real thing. And then he's like, hey, you know what? Drilling tunnels sucks. I'm going to drill tunnels. Like, yeah, great, Elon. I'm going to create a company. I'm called the Boring Company. Like, all right, drunk Elon Musk, hilarious. Now, like, Boring Company is an actual company digging tunnels and stuff everywhere. So I'm at the point when he says, if he's now to something that's doable, um, I mean, it really doable. It's probably real. So he said, "Hey, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna launch this. I'm gonna use as the cargo because the Falcon Heavy is this the be the most powerful rocket since the Saturn V, right? Like, or most powerful rocket now, and it won't be shuttle class, but it's gonna be the most powerful rocket there is. You know, you know, current rocket. Okay, so it can, plans on launching the super powerful rocket and on board. You know, this is capable of putting things, you know, into all sorts of orbits, landing things on Mars, etc." needs a cargo to test it with right and so we're like what's he gonna launch when's he gonna launch there'd been a talk there'd been a talk about putting like a dragon capsule or something on there and doing like a mission to land a dragon space capsule the dragon 2 like on mars the red mars project or a red dragon and that looked like that was gonna be way more complicated to get that pulled off so he needed to do something fun and so he says i'm gonna do this well 
immediately space policy people, et cetera, you know, are like, is this real? Is this whatever? And he has an interesting exchange with apparently somebody at The Verge then says, oh, Elon Musk says he's joking. OK. And so yeah. if you follow Reddit, whatever, says, oh, it's all a joke. It's a joke. Elon Musk says it's joking. Well, the problem is this. We don't know the question that they asked him. They said Elon Musk says it's a joke or he was joking or he made it up. Rather, They said he made it up. But that's what does that mean? You know, where did this idea come from? Oh, I made it up, which means it could still be a real idea. Or uh, is this a real thing? Oh, I made it up, etc. So then we got this sort of, you know, different sort of you know response. The Verge said this. Other people, Eric Berger, other says, nope, he says it's real. Other people at SpaceX confirmed it. As of now, it seems totally confirmed this is a real thing. And then that either he was trolling The Verge or they asked an imprecise question. And given some of maybe the past coverage they've had of him, he decided to give them an answer to just mess with them. So wait a so, minute. So so where are we at then? It's real. Appears to be real. I mean, look it, 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 again. This all makes sense the more you understand that again, SpaceX as we know it now, for whatever we want to layer on top of it in terms of hopes and dreams of creating uh, a, a, a you know the human uh, bridge that makes the human race a multi-planet species, began with Elon Musk wanting to have a live-streamed greenhouse on Mars and looking into, okay, I'm a crazy eccentric billionaire. I want to have a live-streamed greenhouse on Mars. How do I do it? So he goes to U.S. launch companies. He's quoted 60 to $80 million. He tries buying a refurbished uh, a Russian intercontinental uh, uh, ballistic missile. That price winds up going up. And he's just like, screw it. I'll build my own rockets. That's this company. He's this guy. Of course, on a mission like this, he's going to put a car into orbit playing Space Odyssey for billions of years. Why wouldn't he? This is perfectly in line with who this dude is. Well, and plus also, it's it's on the one hand, it looks like like crass cross promotion with a, another company he has. But think about where this places him. If it's successful, yes, it's a crass cross-promotional opportunity where they're taking one company and flinging it out there and it's in orbit around Mars. But if it fails, the story will be him with crocodile tears talking about how he's lost his precious Tesla. And it's like, well, what can you do? This is this is the cost of science. Now, just just for some technical background, if they do a if they do a launch within January or so, it won't actually be able to do it won't be able to orbit Mars, but it can do it have an orbital path that'll take it past like the orbit of Mars. So I mean that's fine. Know, that's, as long as you get in the neighborhood. What you're showing yeah. is we got a gizmo that can go very far, right? Yeah, he says he plans to put cameras on board, maybe put Isaac Asimov's foundation books on board. You know, that'll be kind of a fun thing. What should go on the frunk or you know, what should go on board, you know, this Tesla in space, you, you know, again, he's like cameras on there, figure out a way to beam, you know, images back. I mean, it's kind of rad. Well, <laughs> beyond beyond the, the, the eccentricness of the greenhouse idea, the initial idea was, hey, look, let's spur uh, excitement. You know, I think that there is an element to Elon Musk that very much both in business and in, in a philanthropic ideal is that we should be engaging more about this, that this future is closer than we realize if we believe that we can get there. The greenhouse was that idea. Let's watch this. It's one thing if we hear projections of, well, we can eventually get to Mars. We can eventually do this. But if you can watch a plant grow and you can just click on your computer and see that, it becomes more real. If there is a, a live stream of, you know, Bowie's Space Odyssey playing in, in, a, in a Tesla going around Mars, it just becomes more real in a way that I agree with him matters in the long run. If, if we just all assume for a fact an incremental, if silly, step forward. It makes the rest of this process so much easier because we're now short circuiting the, well, yeah, maybe in 30 years. Yeah, maybe for this amount of money, maybe you need this, that and the other. It's not going to happen. No, look, here's something, albeit frivolous, but it's close. And it's it's now the entire process seems more realistic. So, um <laughs> Speaking of space and commitments, you heard uh, about and, Budweiser. But you know, one, one more thing, just just to Brian's point about like the, the, the crass commercial thing. I think 
if you're launching a car into space around Mars, fine. Whatever. You deserve to put your name on it. You I mean like I don't think that he I, I don't view it as like finally he can sell some Teslas if he just launches this thing around Mars. Well, it's it's funny. I couldn't think of a better segue into the next segment, uh, right Andrew? Yeah, well, yeah. So uh, speaking of moving the frontiers of science and doing the important things, if you want to measure the, the march of civilization, there are different metrics by which you can go by. Uh, metal usage, textiles, agriculture, language, written language, human rights. Meh. Um, one of them is the uh, alcohol. In particular, hops and fermentation, and you know, the ability to ferment, fermenting, you know, okay. fermenting beverages is actually, besides providing, you know, a lot of fun, is actually a way to have a, another sort of food supply or How? drink things in places where your water's bad, whatever. So it's a very legitimate scientific exploration. Uh, sure, let's call it a legitimate scientific exploration to ferment beer on the surface of Mars. How are they planning to get there? Well, Anheuser-Busch has announced, that's just it, that they plan on being the first beer brewed on Mars. So they actually have their own mission, mission patch, and they're going to take the first steps towards doing this, is they have an experiment. They're working on a microgravity beer, and they're putting on putting an experiment that will be on board the International Space Station. It gets launched later this week on SpaceX, <laughs> on the Dragon capsule. And so their goal is they want to start, you know, make a step towards finding out about, you know, brewing in different environments. And I want a little shameless little crass commercialization here from our anti-capitalist uh, Brian Brushwood, <laughs> ah! it's a point of view. Um, uh, I, in my book, uh, How to Make Money on Mars, one of the things I talked about is that like you will have a lot of niche things will be very interesting because certain things will be different. Chemistries, things like that. Things people go and I. Man, I hear this from like, oh, why go to Mars? Why not just go to Antarctica or go to places like this? It's like. It's because things are different. You know, why study mice? We can study people. Things are different. Some things are the same. Some things are different when you have different gravity. Okay. We have different gravity starting with that is biochemistry is different. We're already seeing this in orbit. How bio, we'll get another story about that, about how things functionally or chemically behave differently because there's a lot of the processes we take for granted. Formation of cell structure, formation of crystal structure, the size that certain materials and solutions can get is affected by gravity. So things that are made on Mars, some things will be different. Some things, if you try to take make just a pizza on Mars, in atmosphere, in Earth atmosphere, whatever, it's going to be different. It will taste different because the the dough will rise differently, the sauce will form differently, etc. So it's legit. It's a legit sort of area of expertise. Speaking or, of which, know, exploration. Did you see how garbage those pizzas on the International Space Station look? <laughs> they're <laughs> they're not very tasty looking. Uh, but yeah. this is yeah. the beauty of it being a beer because. Uh, you know, beer and, and various alcoholic beverages have nuance and subtlety that, that come from everything from the, the layers of fog to the temperature to the acidic compounds in the soil or whatever. So so it does matter. Like there is literally no way to fake a Martian beer on Earth. The only way you get to do it is to go to freaking Mars. Yeah, now like even an example, question. we know that antibiotics behave differently in space. They don't work as well. And that might have something to do with just the shape of things as as things are in free fall, you know, they can be more round. And that that change in roundness, you know, more of being more per perfect of a sphere may affect the way antibiotics adhere to it. This is the theory, okay? And so you get, you might have yeast fermentation might affect differently in slightly less gravity, et cetera. So there's a lot of things like, yeah, Brian, I mean, it's like this it's gonna be different. May I ask you a question? Because uh, one of the members of this show has been on the record saying that he will not go to Mars until there is a Taco Bell. Uh, this this brings us if we're in the if we're in the 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 phase where companies are like, well, you want to know what? Let's let's uh, let, let let's start to try uh, uh, you know to, to set these things up here. How far off do you think we are from a Taco Bell on Mars? I right now we look at. Budweiser's willing to spend, I don't know what their total cost to this mission they're doing is. I don't think it's in the millions, but it's probably up. It's still it's still not trivial. They're spending a non-trivial amount of money because it's good PR. It is, and for them, 
they are very interested in the science of brewing. It is a legitimately an interesting thing for them. So they've got a budget, they've got money, they can apport, you know, portion towards PR, which is, this really is, but, but a little bit of an R and D there are scientists who work for Budweiser who are like, yeah, this is really curious. And then what they're going to do is, you know, they, they're going to put seedlings up there, going to put them there for 30 days and bring them back. And then they could do a brand of, you know, space beer or whatever. It tastes interesting or whatever. And, and I've made arguments about like, the niche sort of products that you could get out of Marsh next, you bring back token amounts of quartz or materials and stuff that that have. No, I mean, they'd be. There's no reason to bring them from Mars other than the fact they're from Mars. You bring them to Earth and you put a piece in a coin, you know, and you have a Mars Bitcoin kind of thing, or you have products that you use. Oh, made with blankety blank whatever. Or these seeds came from Mars. That novelty aspect alone would fund a first wave of exploration. I don't make. I don't think that's what's going to be the the future of Mars industry at all. But I think the first wave of exploration. Hey, let's go to India for tea. You know, whatever. There's that. This this is also a uh, a frustratingly smart play on Anheuser Busch's. Uh, Part by, like, uh, did you see the Super Bowl ad where they just crapped all over craft beers when they're when no. they're all like, you're like, oh, look at you with your big beard and you're you're making your craft beer. Hey, look, this is for real people who leave, drink normal beer, not like you weirdos. And uh, so so they are. We're in the middle of a craft beer revolution. So there's a lot of alternatives to the the big uh, Coke and Pepsi's of beer, um, but. None of those small breweries can do this. So it's smart for them to get their name in the headlines doing the type of things that only a global mega conglomerate can do to, to take a rounding error's worth of money and send uh, hops up to space. You know, when SpaceX announced that they were going to be doing the lunar mission, the lunar free return mission, you know, basically sending a capsule with people on board, the Falcon Heavy towards the moon, loop around, come back towards Earth. Gwen Shotwell made the comment a couple weeks ago. Uh, they got a lot of calls from other people with money and means who are like, hey, we would we would like to do this. We would be interested in doing this. And it's one of these things where within space, you have the existing people you go to for space dev, you know, satellite launches, things like this. But then you have other companies and other entities like, oh, yeah, no, we'd be cool. You know, you could I could see, you know, Rolex saying, hey, if we made, you know, it, it, could we grow some crystals or some industrial diamonds in orbit, you know, in free fall? Because then we can come out with, you know, the, Ro the you know, the, the Rolex to the Submariner, the Rolex astronaut, you know, you get things like this. You get a lot of people going, oh, yeah, no, we we spend, you know, how much does how much do we spend on Super Bowl ads, you know? Yeah. And again, I don't think this is the way I, I hear this. Oh, we should make, you know, go to Mars, make it a reality TV show, fun it that way. That way overestimates the amount of money in reality TV. OK, um, and that's that is a way to get a one or two. Some of the, the money you need to do, like the first sort of SpaceX kind of missions is through these other opportunities, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'll tell you what, if, if, if there are eyeballs and there is interest, there will be business. <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, I'm all for it. I think we're going to see a lot more of it. And, you know, Brian's point about Taco Bell, et cetera. I could see at this point somebody could say, hey, let, we're going to take a Falcon rocket. We're going to put a Dragon capsule up there. We're going to orbit for 30 days. We'll put experiments on there. We're going to open it wide up to whoever wants to put something on board. And, you know, it's you know, you're talking now with I don't know what the capsule costs, but you're you're with a reusable booster. Your launch is reduced. You're talking a 50 or 60 million dollar range. You're talking you know, the overage for Justice League. Yeah. So speaking of overage and expensive endeavors. <laughs> Man, you yeah. guys, you uh, guys you don't have any idea how expensive this show is. And because you don't, you should give us money. Yeah. <laughs> uh, indeed. Head on over to patreon.com slash weird things. Well, friends, you might be thinking, wait a minute. What is this? A podcast? Yes. You're listening to it right now. It's also a Patreon page where you can give us money for the podcast. Uh, it's so simple, friends. Head on over to patreon.com slash weird things. Kick us whatever you'd like. And uh, therefore, you become a, uh, a, a, a one of the, the people that are, are making this thing happen. And you get early access to our After Things podcast in its own unique RSS feed. Folks, this, this could not be a simpler process. All you do is get your own 
RSS feed from Patreon, enter it into the podcatcher of your choice. It automatically updates. Easy peasy lemon squeezy. Head on over there right now. Patreon.com slash weird things. So on the subject of growing things on the space station in space, it was a story that sort of made the rounds last week because it had such wonderful sort of sensational sort of headlines. And uh, a Russian astronaut talking about the International Space Station was making the point, said that, you know, we found bacteria on the station's external surface. We find bacteria on the external surface. And he had, and it's hard to know what he said because it was astronaut, uh, Russian cosmonaut Anton Shkapalerov had talked to TASS. Then we got the American reporting of it, and TASS alone is sensational. And then how these things get translated. And he was saying, like, oh, we think it's alien. We think it's alien. Probably alien bacteria found on this, you know, the outer skin of the International Space Station. Which, I mean, you know, certainly anything that doesn't belong on there could be considered alien, you know. If, if, for example, let's say I got snuck not across the space border, and uh, oh no, okay, yeah, uh, we, that seems like a bit more of a stretch. Well, it, so that was sort of this claim. Now it's been sort of like, no, no, it's not. It's not. Don't worry, it's not alien. It's just freaky Earth bacteria that somehow survives the rigors of space and is thriving. You know, are found on the surface of the International Space Station. Don't panic. Uh, so it's been. You know, so it's been changed that. But that is the thing that's interesting is that there is a story that I know one of the people that designed the interior modules, helped design interior modules on the interior on the International Space Station. And one of the things that they did there was they made removable racks. They made everything was removable so you could pull things in and out so you could get to all the different parts of it. Now, on the Russian space station Mir, they didn't do that. Everything was sort of fixed in place, et cetera. So the problem was you have people living continuously inside this small little vessel in a you know perfect environment for humans to function which is also a perfect environment for things like fungus to grow and the story and i haven't heard that i don't know if this was officially acknowledged but one of the reasons they decided to deorbit it was because they were getting all sorts of fungal growth inside of the mirror space station that they couldn't get rid of because it was too inaccessible to reach and there was this fear that you've had this fungus that's now been in orbit for decades, you know, years and years, and it's been irradiated, and it has been, we talked about before, we talked about antibiotic resistance and stuff. There was this, like, you know, maybe better to just deorbit and let the thing burn up in the atmosphere than try to keep the thing going. And, you know, that is, you know, a consideration you know, it's certainly a consideration because you know that thing is is you know they now they do swabs and stuff in the space station and stuff they find all sorts of stuff and and we don't really know what you know really the long-term effects of there's a there's been a a unintentional experiment that's been going and what is the environment you talk about sick building syndrome things like that that's one of the things you have to think about so pleasant dreams <laughs> yeah uh, I, I, I don't know, and I'm sure this is all based on the supposition that that it was a justifiable reason to deorbit the mirror was just based on that. However, can you imagine what a disaster it would be to send an astronaut up to get infected and sick with some kind of cesspool, and then and you're just watching them die up in space or something? That'd be that'd be well, not great PR. I mean, there were multiple reasons, but one of the reasons of like, why not salvage? And they're like, well, there's this thing that, that that's a concern. How much? We don't know. How much do we want to yeah. really look in and find out this is a concern? You know, and, and one of these things they talk about is we make NASA goes to great points about the sterilization procedures we go through with if we ever want to put something on the surface of Mars, et cetera. You know, we don't we make sure we don't contaminate Mars and we go through great, you know, efforts to make sure we don't bring anything back from space. But Life finds a way. <laughs> so, yeah. No. Just freaky. Just freaky. Dude. Mm, speaking of freaky, there's a freak show. There's a traveling freak show going across the heartland of America. Uh, look, oh. I, I, I told you I'm not touring nearly as much as I used to. I, I, I'm mainly doing stuff in front of the camera these days. I'm talking about the post-apocalyptic slam down wrestling show <laughs> known as what we see 
in a thing called Journey Quest. Okay. I remind oh. you, last time on Journey Quest. Wait. Oh, oh, oh I thought that. I thought that was a toss. Journey Quest. Oh. Okay. I have no idea what the Journey Quest recap toss is. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, th I think. I think historically, we've just fumbled waiting for you to go filling air. So, oh, uh, yeah. I, I would say going forward, uh, you can interrupt any of us with Journey Quest. For example, me right now. Previously on Journey Quest. What do you say we let loose? all these animals no not this button you're not allowed to press this button <laughs> pound sand dweeb right <laughs> hit the button whoa whoa i'm not with the golden emperor okay okay where, where, where who are you i'm an agent gentlemen first fight bryce vegas <laughs> Dude, this is it, Justin. We're going back on the road. We're gonna make our way out west. We're gonna get back to back to our roots, to our original quest. Well, uh, also known as we're going to leave Texas for the first time in the like year long journey of Journey Quest. The entire time we have apparently made our way from Austin to two hundred miles out of Austin. <laughs> Although it's been disguised as many different things, including time travel and alternate realities. All that apparently was an elaborate farce. And now for the first time, we're going to make our way to, well, wherever Bryce Vegas is. Although I think I think I might have heard a, a yeah, whisper. Dude, bad bad, oh, bad oh, news. Uh, uh, Bryce Vegas is in Fredericksburg, Texas. I, I don't think you got the word on that. I swear to you, it was going to be old El Paso. That was the... <laughs> I was going to be like, congrats, you're going to see signs that go, El Paso. Like, yeah, why? Well, Vegas is Vegas. This is Bryce Vegas. Uh, listen, Justin, uh, let's just focus on the gig, man. All we got to do is is we, we, we got a good setup now. We're about to have decent armament. Uh, all we have to do is show up and perform. Uh, okay, let's all understand that this is going to go south immediately. Like uh, 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 we're also coming back into contact uh, into contact with Bryce, apparently, who who has uh, a habit of trying to kill us. Uh, That's every when time we're not we making him. him money. I'm telling you, I know this Bryce. He's not going to be all wrapped. I mean, he's a practical person. He's all about them dollars. All right. How do you know? I mean, I worked with him in the before times. I, I don't know if you remember. He used to he used to uh, produce. No, I, I know. Podcast. I. I I, I'm aware. However, your relationship has not, to this point, uh, uh, allowed uh, uh, him to not want to murder you. In fact, uh, uh, remember, I mean, look, look, want, we've always had, we, Bryce and I have always had a capricious work environment, so it makes sense that he would do this in the post-apocalyptic times. Because all that's happening is that is that we're just more of what we were beforehand. So let's let's go let's go be more well, awesome. We're going to do it. I'm just saying let's let's be on the same page that this is going to go not well very quickly. Well, certainly with that attitude. I'm just saying <laughs> let's let's just let's let's be goal oriented and try to make this work. Look, we brought you back from the brink, man. You were under mind control serum just a couple weeks ago. Now look at you. Do you want to know why I was under mind control serum, Brian? I, look, I understand that we all have pressures and it's easy to escape from time to time. Yeah, because you escaped from uh, with the, 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 the new Reich or wherever. You jumped out of the, 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 the dirigible and you split us up. And then I wound up getting cornered by a bunch of cannibal kids. And then eventually the Golden Emperor, where I was hey, presumably hey, in hey, fact hey, that is hey. for it untold, uh, put under mind control. Hey, 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 focus, focus. We agreed no carpet bagging, no, no grabbing, no, no, no hoarding of our past grievances to throw in each other's faces. We agree I'm that we're saying, a team. Then let's then let's look forward instead of letting all this stuff happen to us. So we make panic snap judgments that lead us into further trouble. Okay. All well, so, so so our uh, we're in other words, you're saying we need a plan. We need a plan yes. going into Bryce Vegas. Okay. Now just just for background, they're having this argument on the battle RV, which is driving across the desert highway towards. Bryce Vegas. Yeah. Okay. okay. So we get we got uh, a few. Uh, by, minutes. by the way, by the way, uh, 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 for, for the for the DM, uh, uh, what what are we seeing? Can we can we see out the windows? Like what? what nighttime. What is, what? Nighttime. You're you're seeing you know post apocalyptic landscape. You know. So okay. it, it, no it other cars burned out. Occasional fires. Maybe dogs chasing after you. Feral children. That kind of thing. Look at us, man. 
how back in the before time, how much did we talk about going taking our act on the road? Like, let's do night of day. That, now we're physically going to be attacking people in the night on the road. This is a dream come true. Wait, no, that is that is a very good point. Wait, are, are, is the gig at night, and can we call our team night attack? Um, yeah, there's actually a Mexican team called Team Night Attack, so... <laughs> Okay, so we call ourselves the copyrights reset after the apocalypse. Just so you know, that's fine. We're a totally independent work called Nido Ataco. That's it's totally oh, different. God. Night Taco. Oh, Night Taco. <laughs> Talk. Wow, that was apparently even 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 from Bryce Vegas, you could hear the groan on that joke. <laughs> that's problematic. <laughs> okay, all right. Look, uh, here's the important part. How committed are you, Justin? To us, what's the best best path? Do we get there? And Hold then on, just knock, knock, knock. Manager. Hey, guys, listen. I'm excited. Uh, it seems like you're having a conversation here. While you do this, I need you to figure out uh, a, a name and a gimmick and some outfits and stuff. I've, I've got a, I've got a, we've got a seamstress chained up up front. We can take care of everything you need, whatever you want. Just let me know. Great, uh, Justin. All right. Yeah. I need to know. We're gonna gloss over the chained up part. <laughs> <laughs> um, I need to know how committed you are to us fulfilling our obligations yes. on this gig. It seems to me like getting paid and well-armed is a good way for us to head out west. But if you're going to suddenly decide that, like, running away mid, mid-gig, mid I, I just got to know no. going into this. No, no, no. Number one, don't say the thing that you always do is the thing that I'm going to do. I am not going to run away halfway through. I am here. The goal here is the only reason why I signed on, knowing that this is almost certainly a trap, is that at least we will have access to weapons and we will have access to transportation. If if they are fair dealing, then we fight our way to get out west. Uh, uh, that is the plan. But let's just be aware that if and when this thing goes sideways, we are going to have to make some moves. Okay. Having said that, what do you think of calling ourselves the Bludgeon Brothers? Uh, no, that sounds terrible. How about we 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 call ourselves? Uh, we 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 can't call ourselves the the. <laughs> how about how about we call ourselves the original Night Attack? <laughs> how about Night Attack Two? Hold on. What if we call oh ourselves God. the New Night Attackers? <laughs> That way they know it's a sequel. Yeah. Wait, uh, hold on, uh, uh, hold on. How about this? The people who come upon you late in the evening and commit violence. And and our gimmick can be that we're kind of Victorian. Maybe maybe we could grow mustaches and 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 adopt the Victorian style pugilism stance. Uh I I really just feel like we need to go back to our our, our, our classic roots and and we Enjoy Wait, the what? garden, a night attack tribute. Uh, uh, yeah, all right, so there we go. Enjoy the garden, a night attack tribute, and uh, uh, it's we're, we're very botanically themed. Like <laughs> <Okay>. we, <laughs> that's good. Uh, in fact, in fact I, 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 at the beginning of each uh, of, of each uh, match, we toss out bags of leaves into the audience. <laughs> we just throw <laughs> leaves at them. But, hey, hey guys, but we don't we don't want here. we don't want just any leaves that are premium leaves. Let's grab all the leaves of like just the garbage plants that are growing anywhere. What I'm saying, let's throw bags of weed out at the audience. We'll yes. just go. We'll find weeds and we'll we'll yeah. say who likes hey, weed. Hey, manager here, I have an idea for. T I was just just I got a list here. I just gonna throw this out. Just spitballing. Just spitballing. Uh. Night Slam Federation of Wrestlers. Hmm. 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 Oh, there we go. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 You know well, what? We we'll call ourselves faces? Team NSFW for short. That that's, that works for well, me. Yeah, I guess we could do that. And thought about that. Huh. All right. I mean, I don't know. Maybe maybe going back. Maybe we we could be the bro the 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 the, the uh, Bludgeon Brothers live show. <laughs> the bb live show for short that'd be great <laughs> oh you know what we're a couple of unusual blokes why don't we call ourselves team weird things no there's actually there's actually some team in southern california called that just mm. so you know ah oh, damn damn mm. foreshadowing mm -hmm. <laughs> uh okay i say we'll go with team uh uh enjoy the garden <laughs> a night attack tribute uh, and, and we and we throw refuse, lawn refuse, at the audience. Yeah. Mmm. Enjoy the garden. Uh, You're not feeling we'll it. We'll give it. 
we'll, we'll try it. We'll give it a try. All right. You know, might have to change the gimmick up, but maybe we'll give it a try. You know, so. Um, okay. So it, it seems like right now we should get geared up for a big battle. Uh, can, can, can we get a quick assessment of our of our of our stuff? I assume I still have a, in working order my right arm replaced with a, a chainsaw, right? Yeah, yeah, we got that. Uh, listen, um, we found a Ren Fair for some reason that didn't know the apocalypse happened, and so we've got a couple metalsmiths and some people like that chained up in the back. We got them. Whatever you need, let me know. The trailer attached. It's all good. All right, Justin. Now's the time. If you want, if you want to get enhanced like yours truly, I mean, there's there's no missiles flying by for you to try to touch. But uh, our, our our leather master is amazing, by the way. Yeah. So I'm not going to mutilate myself, uh, but I'm I, again strike two on this chain thing. Like we're really we're just gonna let this totally pass by. Look, man. Oh, it's oh, a different I'm sorry. World. Uh, I didn't know that your RVs all have seat belts. Pardon me. Oh, they're just like that's that's a new seat belt thing, or yeah, to be chained. Of. Kind of, you know, I mean, like, I mean, a seatbelt's a good idea. Why just wear it part of the day? Hey, uh, can, can, can we go talk to the leather master and the, and the, and the, the, the coppersmith? Sure. All yeah. right. Uh, I, I walk over and I'm just like, uh, Hey man, um, uh, it'd be pretty great if I could just swap out this, uh, this chainsaw for something else. Can, can you make like a detachable system of, of gizmos? Like I, I, I just want. A, a copper fist with the middle finger extended. Um, it would be great if I could cause the middle finger to go up, but failing that, I'll just have the middle finger out all the time. If, mm. if that's so, yeah, doable. no. Oh, yeah, I, I, I've, I've done this before. It's a sex toy. Got it. You and your partner want this thing. Got it. Okay. <laughs> you know right. what? That's, that's fine. He <laughs> turns to Justin. How big do you want the finger to be? Yeah, okay. So that's not what we're doing. And also, but that's a, that's an okay. I've done this before a lot. Like, this is. <laughs> Dude, like I work Ren Fairs. What do you think? <laughs> so uh, uh, if you can make the middle finger one that looks like a middle finger, like it looks like a novelty fist with a middle finger, but I can reach forward and take the middle finger out and, and in it will reveal one jagged uh, um, uh, uh, dirk uh, or, or spike. And then, and then the other, like in my hand, I'll be holding a knife in there. You never know. You never know. Okay. So uh, bear, um, this is good with you. <laughs> Okay, again, this is not a sex toy. We are violent warriors who are going across the uh, uh, apocalypse ravaged country, satisfying our bloody revenge. As whatever your fighting. kink, that's fine. This is okay, not a place of not judgment. Kink, this man. is no judgment I'm just here. Saying, he's trying to have a. I leave. <laughs> uh, I, I look at him. I was like, uh, maybe I have two backups. You know, get creative with it. Just, just, just give yeah. me a little selection here. I'll trust he's you a, he, when the moment he's comes. Uptight. He seems pretty uptight about it. You know, yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a strange new world. Not everybody understands their place. I'm not uptight. I slam back in. I wasn't listening, but I'm not uptight. I just want to let <laughs> yeah. you know. Okay, so, so I, I'm hoping you know, just send that over to, uh, to, to, to my cabin when, whenever you know, those are ready. There's a spa. There's a spa on the way to El Paso, which you might want to check out. You guys, maybe you know, some couple time might be good. This might be good. Uh, you know? All right, all right. It sounds great, man. Uh, I, I I throw him uh, whatever pocket change I have as a tip. Thanks, th th thanks. <laughs> He's a slave, Brian. I I walk back in, <laughs> and I, I say, I say, which You're only tossing makes him money. This... He's a slave. Where is he going to spend it? At the Bed Bath and Beyond. <laughs> <laughs> I, it only makes it all the more precious than that he's been given a token. It's called appreciating other people, Justin. Come on. All right. Well, enough. Uh, you, uh, apparently, he hasn't been loosed of his uh, sass. Hey, this is my lifestyle choice. Don't judge. Don't judge. Oh, Jesus. All right. Uh, whatever. Okay, so we go to leave, and then I I, I open my my door one more time, and I lean my head in, and I'm like, oh, uh, a replacement ding-dong would be great, too. And then I close the door. Okay. <laughs> Already working on it. Got it. Uh, so you hear the sound of metal clanking, blank, 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 blank. And then the uh, the battle RV. Every now you hear sporadic gunfires. The people who protect the battle RV, et cetera, are, you know, shooting people in the middle of the night or monsters or children begging for food, whatever. And finally, it comes to a screeching halt. Engine stops. Manager comes and says, hey, guys, listen. Little... 
little hitch, tiny little hitch, little problem, but there's a solution. One door closes, you break a window in another house. That's what my mom always said, okay? Um, we ran out of gas. Mm. The good news is, is Texas. There's a lot of oil. There's a lot of gas, right? There's a town. There's a town maybe half a mile up the road. They've got gas. Uh, they've got gas. You know what they don't have? You know what they don't have? What? Uh, a a, a world-class touring uh, duo show? Ding, ding. <laughs> winner, winner. They don't have entertainment. They actually have their own little amateur wrestling group there. Okay. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it's the the Desert Bird Wrestling League. J- Justin, Justin, this seems like the perfect. They're not even good at names, guys. This, this seems um, like the perfect opportunity for us to get a little warm up. We're about to hit the big leagues. We don't want to go in cold. Let's, let's, let's. Come on, man. Let, let, let's, let's do it. We'll get I, some gas. They have their team. They have their town favorites, a duo. It's called Congo and Mongo. Okay. And, and I thought maybe a little exhibition match for some gas money. Great. No, in. Uh, on behalf of my partner, I think it's a great idea. Let's do it. I'm in. I'm in. All right. Do, do we like? Uh, do, is there like another car that was like riding along ours, or do we get like a motorcycle to get into town, or we got to hoof it? Yeah, we're gonna, it's gonna walk. It'll be good. It's be good. It's be good. Uh, but we're yeah, gonna have our, our, our armed guys with us to to you know to. Are any of them big know, enough that what... I could ride one of their shoulders? Uh, you, know, you know, Brian. They're just you know you. I, you know, I, I, in the next contract, I can make that a thing for you. You know, I already See, talked to the is... leather master. I know you guys have tastes. All right, all right, fine. Are into, and fine, I'll so. walk. I'll walk. And and, and 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 I'm still mech. I'm I'm mech enhanced, right? Or, but, wasn't I like you were in a uh, you were in a suit that sort of like kind of like the battery sort of ran down and stuff, and so it's kind of like your dragon dead weight. Okay, so I no longer have the suit. Or at least I mean, it's not very suit, effective. It's just not really. Oh wait, can we get that recharged? Like that, 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 that seems to me that, that was the only reason why I was excited about becoming a professional fighter. I, I checked all the plugs. We don't have the right plug for that. I mean, might they have it in town? Maybe, maybe they might. They've got a fireworks right, stand. The, by the way, Brian, this is priority number one because, like, right, like, like that was the reason why we were in this is because we had this suit. Like, if we don't have this suit, we're screwed. Okay, look, I I know it's gonna be slow and draggy, but I'm gonna need you to walk on that in that suit, you know, the two miles into town, and we'll look for some kind of generator, you know, some kind of some kind of generator we can generate electricity with. <laughs> yeah, good plan, right. Brian. So you guys are kind of it's slow going because Justin's kind of dragging kachunk, 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 kachunk. Finally, you see some lights. You see some like little string lights, whatever, and you see the town. Now, it's not the it's it's kind of sad. It's like got Quonset Hut buildings and stuff. It seems like there's more like places selling cigarettes and alcohol than you know. I don't know, eating establishments or, you know, coffee shops. All right. So I, I, I walk up and I and I and I slap Justin on the shoulder and I say, uh, you know what these people are hungry for? You know what we're here to do, Justin? Yeah. We're hungry for food. Somebody yells out of nowhere. I whisper you know. into Justin's ear. I'm like, no. Clean water. <laughs> we're here to offer hope. We're here to offer just for a few seconds a distraction from their dreary day-to-day lives. We're you here to bring them joy. Sitting on the hood of a car. A uh, what? What? Sitting on the hood, leaning on the hood of the car, right? A couple of, couple of cops they're watching. In the background, in the background as this happens, there's about four or five gang members beating up an old woman carrying a bag of groceries. Uh, I... I... I salute with my chainsaw hand the cops and say thank you for your service as we keep walking by. Wait, hold on. We're going to be good guys? I mean, where where are the big bad guys coming in from out of town beating up their local heroes? You think we're going to win their hearts? I mean, I, I think we can. I, I I was hoping so. Is this, is this, mm, okay. I mean, like, I, I just think we're swimming upstream on that one. Also, it, I think it's pretty clear from this world building that, like, that, that, that there is uh, uh, just total lawlessness here that maybe 
they actually want more than just us beating people up. Okay, like we might yeah, need yeah, to beat yeah, up the a gang. small six year old child wearing a t shirt that comes down to her knees comes up running up, says, They're here, they're here, they're here. I say, oh, oh, now, Justin, you realize like uh, we're not going to sell shirts as the heels. Like, like we we got to offer hope. And she uh, here. spits in your face, Brian, as she points to her Mongo and Congo shirt. Says they're going to kick your butts, and she right. runs away. Uh, you know what? I'm done. I I, I rev my uh, chainsaw hand four or five times, and then I I announce like uh, to the world. I say, uh, "What's up, you benighted fools? You losers!" Yeah. You backwater garbage town. We finally bring to you civilization and podcasting. I, I look at him and I say, hey, listen, you weasels. I'm here to do th three things. <laughs> Chew gum, kick ass, and find a generator. And I'm all out of gum, but I still need the generator. <laughs> Well, you come through a line of smashed up cars, broken cars, and you see kind of an arena, kind of like it's made of like the arena's made just from like just junk, kind of a junkyard sort of area. And you can see that there's people sitting all around bleachers and stuff, but it's real a haphazard. It makes a Thunderdome look like a really well planned I am pie masterpiece. OK, yeah. so you enter there and a lot of people wearing overalls and stuff, but it's, it's pretty crowded, you know, and there's actually a fight. On stairs, like a, there's an early match going on right now, and uh, yeah, uh, do, do you right. know what you see on the opening card? Do you know what you see? Is it I the human know. generator? No, no, no. Oh. There is a big. You know, there's a big, there's a generator though powering the lights though, and it's really wait. close to one corner of the ring. Just saying, and there's some extra cables and stuff. Just saying. Hold on, wait a minute. A, a generator generating electricity? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Indeed. Indeed. <laughs> Close to the corner of the stage of the stadium. All right, stage, all right. We know. All right, there we go. All right. So who's who's in who's in the who's in the ring? Well, what you see is two children fighting <laughs> uh, on okay. the backs of Great Danes. <gasps> oh my god! Kind of like jousting. It's kind of adorable, but really sad because the knives and sharp stuff, weapons are like real. Okay, is anybody guarding the generator right now? Is anybody paying attention to it? No, 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 no. All right, really. well, let's let's uh, let, let's hustle on over. Let's let's yeah. get you hooked up and juiced up so that we can we can make this happen. So so we walk over to the generator and I I look to see if there's a way to connect his power armor. It's a cable. You got a big electrical cable. Huh. I I just shove it right on in and 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 ask him how's is it charging? Yeah, it's charging. You're charging him. He's gonna nice. charge. Great. So all we gotta okay. do is hang out here and then we we'll just wait for the match. Child loses an eye, match is over. They clean him off the stage, wipe off the stage. How how how, how charged is Justin? Fifteen percent. Okay, all right. Look, I I gotta buy a next time. match coming up. Mystery match. It's not, it's okay. not you guys. Oh, now it's just like, can you guess what we're gonna see next? Can you guess? Uh, uh probably more uh, child uh, endangerment. Wrong, 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 wrong. <laughs> it's not even close. Wait, who's, who am match. I talking to? <laughs> also, Old lady I... ladder match. Old lady ladder match. Oh, right on. Okay, I I, I go buy some popcorn. Um, and uh, I I ask around to see if anybody has uh one of my replacement hands because I would like to eat popcorn with my right hand. So you hear the jangle of a chain, <laughs> 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 and you look over. And there's the leather master with the chain around his neck, and he's holding his own chain. <laughs> That's great. I was, Good I was like, him. "Good for him." I, I, I take off my uh, 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 chainsaw. I put it in my back, my knapsack, uh, my inventory, <laughs> and then I, and I gesture with my stump hand. I was like, "What you got? Let me see." Pulls out his velvet case. It opens it up, and there is the new hand, as you asked for. But it's, it doesn't have the joint. It doesn't have the middle finger joint. Mm. Uh, he turns to Justin with a long, slim case, <laughs> flips it open, presents to him the finger. <laughs> okay, again... Uh, I thought uh, it'd be uh, appropriate if you connected it to there. Oh, Jesus. All right, fine. Brian, bring your stupid hand over here. <laughs> okay, I bring my stump. I I uh, 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 attach his finger to the, to the, to the, the fist. The leather master's weeping. He's like, 
<laughs> I, I wave it around. Uh, now, uh, uh, can you get, describe to me what, what, what prehensile capabilities this uh, new attachment has? The thing you asked for? Yeah. Yeah. Can it, can it, this... can it, can it, gl- it's just, it's just a hand, right? It's a giant hand phallus. It's what you asked great. for. Great. Okay, great. Uh, I, I go and order popcorn. And I begin to uh, to to shovel popcorn into my mouth with my with your giant hand, hand phallus. phallus. Yeah. Oh, and just don't forget this gives you a big thing of it's, it's... Of, of of lubricant. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, because yeah. because there's okay. the all right. Hey, leather master. Uh, what a hell of a guy. Real real fast worker. You're uh, that was actually remarkable. You made a lot in a little bit of time. Look at you. <laughs> He's just, uh, where? How, how, how charged am I? Seventeen percent. Okay, I offer uh, him a handful of popcorn from my. my... Uh, that's fine, fine, uh, fine. Uh, how, how, oh, how, how are you hear the sound with the old of a cracking hip and the scream of an old woman? <laughs> like, ladies and gentlemen, looks like we have a winner. All right, next up. Anyway, uh, can, can we flag our? Uh, can we flag our, our agent over? Hey, what's up, guys? What's up? Hey, so uh, 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 have you like worked out all, all all the details on this? Like, so wh- wh- when when we win, we get how much gas? How much money? Like, like what's the what, what's the what's the deal here? So, uh, yeah, so there's an interesting angle here. Um, uh, Mongo and Congo are undefeated, and uh, I'm thinking maybe we do a different kind of play here, kind of the safer play. Yeah. Uh, wait. Yeah, you're not suggesting we try to lose. Hey, great idea. <laughs> well, I, I, that, that that wasn't me suggesting it. That would that was me. Well, hold on. What would the upside be? Um, I can guarantee get us gas money. You know, guaranteed gas money. Not a problem. Not a problem. Guaranteed gas money. You know, we we know we know if we go in and say we're going to lose, if I agree to some parties involved in advance that we're going to lose the match, throw the match, then I guarantee we'll get the gas money. Oh, man. Uh, Wait, hold on. Was there a chance we wouldn't get the gas money if we won? No, no. If you won, you'd get the gas money. We'd get the gas money. Uh, Just the problem is that, you know, they may murder us. If we defeat the town champions. Yeah, plus also, like, it's the gas money we care about, Justin. I mean, look, we're here to put on a show. I figure we go in hot and hard, and and I hold up my, my new fist. Yeah, uh, and we then, picked up on that. <laughs> and then, and, but then we just got to lose halfway through. We get the gas money. Who cares what these benighted yokels think? I'm, listen, I'm all fine doing the job. I'm, I'm starting to look cross-eyed at our, at our, at our agent here for throwing this uh, little wrinkle here at the nah, last minute. Just being flexible. I'm sure this is not foreshadowing of any kind of disaster imminent down the road. All right. Uh, uh, yeah, fine. Well, well, we'll lose to Mongo and Congo, and, and uh, we get our gas money, and that's it. Okay. For the record, though, All I'm right. fine. Uh, if, if, if stuff goes down, I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm fine getting our way out of there by any means necessary. Also, do me a favor. While we're here, can we find, like, transportation back to our van so we're not uh, walking another two miles? I'll, 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 I'll see what we can do. See, I'll see, see around. I can arrange Pulse something around. for you guys. And yeah, yeah, it's good. It's good. And, and and I mean, if we lose and we have to spend, you know, a couple of weeks in the Mexican League to sort of build back up your reputation, that's fine. That's fine. Whoa, whoa, hold on. So you're saying that us losing means we don't get our big gig in El Paso? Bryce Vegas. Bryce Vegas. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> well, I I can't take uh, guys that were just defeated straight into Bryce Vegas. You know what I'm saying? So then, they need to sort of kind of reinvent you in an undercard. Okay, so yeah, we uh, are going to win then because we are going to Bryce Vegas and then we are going out west as you promised when you signed us when we were literally running past you. I, I mean, I, here's the important thing. You have a secured promise that we'll get the gas if we lose, right? And... They've objectively stated that if we uh, win, we'll get the gas. I think we could take it from here. Sure thing. Sure thing. Ladies and gentlemen, I, we I hope I... you enjoyed the last match of man fighting 100 rabid squirrels <laughs> in a bag, although you couldn't see it, though it sounded pretty amazing. I look over. Uh, I look you know, over dog I... fighting is illegal here. We don't allow that. That's just inhumane. I look over at Justin's power meter to figure out how charged he is. 22%. <sighs> okay. 
Uh, I I walk out and I say, hold on, everyone. Before the show, and this is not an attempt to stall and buy time so that uh, Justin might become more charged, I've got a little something special for you. Who here likes magic? And I throw my fists up in the air. Crickets, Brian. Crickets. I was like, ha! I felt the same way. But let me tell hey, you... Look, look at our wall of magic, says the announcer, and it's the severed heads of close-up and street performers. I was like, well... Oh, no. How can you tell just from that? <laughs> because you recognize them. <laughs> like, there's David Blaine. There's Chris Angel. <laughs> no, I mean, there's, you know, some guy, you know, with his, you know, scam stuff hat on. <laughs> I say, uh... I say, you know what? Magic sucks. Uh, have a good evening. And then I'm back into the corner. <laughs> good good call. Good call. Good call. Uh, so, uh, listen, uh, ladies and gentlemen, getting ready now for the match. The match you've been waiting for. Well, what? what are, who, who are these guys again? Mongo and Congo. No, 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 you idiots. No, <laughs> your me. names. Oh, What's us? your names? Your manager Ooh, wasn't yeah. quite clear we're, on what the names were. Enjoy the garden. Things. Oh, man, Justin, enjoy we forgot. Enjoy the garden. We oh, yeah, shit. The... Do, we, do, we, do, we, do we have our leaves? Okay, I run over and I start picking up weeds and I say, who likes weed? <laughs> now I'm throwing dirt. The crowd in. just stares at you. Just stares at you. Like, Good. This is like, or this is a, we've heard of the heel and the face. This is just... <laughs> The clown? What is this? I don't. Uh, I, I, uh, I, I. More dirt. Throw more dirt. <laughs> I throw more dirt. I throw more dirt. She's frying. You start throwing dirt in people's eyes. I'm like, ah, oh, oh, why are you doing this? I use my my copper fist as as some like rocks. a trowel. You're throwing rocks at the audience now. They're behind. Right now, they're behind kind of a fence. It's not a sturdy fence. Now you're getting riled up. Now they're getting angry. Like, so you know. I start tossing up uh, rocks and then and then hitting them as if with an aluminum uh, except copper bat, <laughs> and then just hitting them all over the place. Yeah, right. finally, that's a little improvement to these ugly. Oh yeah, where are we? We need to we need to be yelling out the town. They always like it when you talk poop about the town. Oh, that's easy. the 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 town is you know. Uh, something town sad just, wages yeah. i know hey listen as soon as we came in we knew we were in something town when buenos we, nachos uh, buenos nachos texas we knew that we were in buenos nachos as soon as the smell hit us on our, on the way in that's why we're throwing dirt on you animals it was, it was so funded it, it was started founded, the town was founded by actually like a freshman um uh spanish class that from like North Dakota, they weren't really good at it, so you know they they, they declared it Buenos Nachos. Good. Hey, everybody here sucks. We rule. I uh, I, uh, I I I hit my copper fist on a rock so it rings loudly. Ding. Uh, all right. Kind of cool. Uh, uh, <laughs> Crowd kind of goes. Ooh, ooh. That's kind of cool. <laughs> like, oh, that's kind of neat. I, I I I take one last look at my power meter. Your power meter, at? you're at eighty three percent. Nice, pretty good, yeah, pretty good. good. All right, so I I, I unplug uh, I, I unplug my 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 charge and I say uh, I jump into the ring. Hey, look, I know that there's two losers who like to fancy themselves champions here in this town. I want to let each and every one of you know that you're idiots for believing in them, and we're gonna make you look like idiots for ever thinking that they had a chance. Bring these schmoes out. Uh, you hear the crowd is just riled up something, something crazy, something crazy. Now, the other end, the other end of this arena, there is like a big metal warehouse shed. You got the big two big sliding doors there. You see a ray of light poking through there and you hear the sound of metal clanking, metal pounding. All of a sudden, this this rock and roll PA system kicks on. They didn't hear before. They didn't use it for the early acts. Now it's like, ladies and gentlemen, your hometown favorites, the destroyers of destruction, the annihilators of the apocalypse, the killers of killing, <laughs> the terrors of terror, <laughs> the alliterations of alliteration. <laughs> 
I, I, I give you Congo and Mongo next week on Journey Quest. Ah, the fight. We got this, man. We got this. We got win. We're not doing another. We're not doing three weeks of, of rebuilding in Mexico. <laughs> we got this. We're going to be fine. Bet you they're kids. Mm. Mm. We haven't explained the rules of the match yet either, have we? Ooh. Hold on. Hold on. Wait, wait, wait. What am I hearing? What am I hearing? All right. Uh, gentlemen, do we have any picks? Uh, you know what? I don't have anything that springs immediately to mind, although I am finally reading Tom Merritt's book, Pilot X. Uh, it's, it's very well produced on uh, uh, Audible. So uh, I'm about halfway through it right now and enjoying it uh, quite a bit. So Tom Merritt's Pilot X is my pick. Sweet. Uh, I am going to pick uh, actually something that Brian tipped me off to yesterday. Uh, uh, we got five episodes into Hulu's original series, Future Man. Yes. Yes. Did you enjoy it? <laughs> It is a uh, a a uh, Evan Goldberg, uh, Seth Rogen produced uh, uh, show. It centers around a uh, you know lovable schmo who works as a uh, a janitor that uh, beats an unbeatable game, and uh, uh, only to find out that it's the as he says himself the the plot of the last Starfighter, uh, uh, and that it was a simulation. It really is kind of a a, a a love letter to how many different things it rips off uh, to the point where there is a, a reoccurring gag. Spoiler alert, time travel gets involved. Uh, there, there's a reoccurring gag to using the Back to the Future uh, realization <laughs> chime. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, whatever, he's like looking over at something. But, uh, you know, it's it's uneven. Uh, uh, and, and there are some elements where I, I just kind of, I, I, I wish it were a little bit more sanded and polished, but by and large, it, it is, it is really fun and, uh, I'm enjoying it. Very cool. Very cool. Um, I've been nonstop. The only thing I've been watching, oh, that's true. I'm going to, I, I watched on HBO. I watched, as I say, I've been watching like every episode of doctor who that's available and i'm still in like the first doctor era which is just interesting and one of the things i appreciate and i mentioned this before is you know they it's a show they had no resources they had no money but the the crew that you you look at this and the shows and you kind of laugh like oh it's so cheap it's like it's not by choice that the people making this show had a limited budget the writing for what era is actually pretty strong writing and What's kind of cool is that, you know, where they could be imaginative and try to figure out how to make things work, you know, about roughly 10 years after this first, you know, first couple seasons of Doctor Who was made, there was a scrappy little film production shooting in England where they had very little resources. They were trying to do science fiction. And because they were able to rely on a number of people who had worked on Doctor Who and doing props and stuff like this they were able to turn this little movie into a thing called Star Wars. And so, you know, the roots of Star Wars actually, as far as production design, believe it or not, actually in some ways are tied to the people making this Doctor Who films and trying to figure out how to make the most, how to make a big sci-fi world out of next to nothing. So, anyway, I'm enjoying that. And then I watched the Lego Batman movie. That was really fun. Oh, I still haven't seen that. It's fun. It's good. It's good. It's good. good. So, Cool. Bryce, do you want to throw in a pick? Oh, you know what? I did see something this weekend. I saw uh, Exporting Raymond. Have you guys seen this? It no, is heard a, about it. Uh, it's a short documentary about the process of taking Everybody Loves Raymond and adapting it to Russian television. Whoa. Your button is on. Whoa. Uh, yep. it, it is, it's pretty cool. It follows the, the creator of Everyone Loves Raymond uh, as he goes to Moscow and is trying to, like... Uh, in part, you know, what is what he considers to be a very universal sort of viewpoint of the show, which is, you know, I, think I did the, watch this. Yeah. It yeah. was like, you know, the mediocrity of everyday life, the little arguments that you get into when you're fighting um, and and how he is sort of butting heads with the people in in Russian entertainment who 
you know, like things over the top and 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 glamorous and big and loud and. Uh, yeah, they tried to make like I remember they want to like have Raymond be like a much more handsome guy or something. Yeah. And they, like, everybody had to be sexy or something or. Yeah. It, it was yeah. A, the, the casting, especially for Raymond was like, is like a big point in this documentary of like, they, they found a funny guy that they liked, but the, there was a thing with the theater house that he worked in where they wouldn't let him go. And then oh, yeah, they yeah. found some action star guy who didn't really have good timing and stuff. It's pretty cool. It, it was on Netflix, uh, and and it was a pretty easy watch. That's uh, exporting Raymond. Yeah, they literally had to go to, like the theater guys, uh, the director of it, the theater program there, to ask permission to try to get him to the show. And the guy didn't really think much of TV and what. And it was yeah, very. It was very interesting. Just you just it kind of you makes you sort of appreciate how easier it is to sort of do things here too. <laughs> and and but you know other like in other countries like I've noticed that. There is a lot of tradition, a lot of prestige about who you work with or work for. You know, that is very much, ooh, I was trained by so-and-so. And, you know, that has a, ooh, you know, like more so, you know, than here. Mm -hmm. Cool. Very, very cool. Um, good. Uh, I, I guess, you know, it's, 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 it's been weird. Smooth. <laughs> Smooth. It's, it's, you know, Weird. Cool. Nice. It's weird. All right. Not yeah. at all weird. <laughs> nope. No. Not all right. weird. Okay. BRB. We'll take a little, right. little break. Uh, Code Supreme asks if anybody saw Shot in the Dark on Netflix. I started watching that until I realized, oh, this is like a reality show sort of thing. That's a weird format for that idea. Um, so I, I only got like a couple minutes into it before I was like, nah, I'm not, I'm not, this is not what I want to watch right now. And then I actually did end up watching that um, Jim and Andy, the Great Beyond movie. Oh yeah, was that good? I thought it was pretty good. Uh, it's, uh, <laughs> I don't know. I, I remember hearing, uh, you know, Brian Brian's been talking about it for a while, uh, and having pretty different different opinions on it than he did. Uh, but it was, it's, it's interesting. It's a really interesting idea of like going. Well, they initially wanted it to be, um, like promo for the movie, right? Yeah. Like they're going to release it with the movie. It was originally going to be part of the press kit and then, yeah. and then, uh, I, I believe what part of the story is like, well, Universal started seeing some of that footage and said, hey, no, don't put that out. It makes Jim Carrey look like an asshole. Yeah. Um, and so, but, but like, I think it's the sort of thing where that would have been perfect footage for whatever that Man in the Moon movie would have been. Yeah. Because that, that, yeah. that tells, a, I don't know, it feels like that tells a very strong part of the tale of making that movie, which from... Hearing Brian talk about it the other day was just sounds like them recreating classic Kaufman bits. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. Um, yeah, Gambling Man. Uh, Glitch is good. Glitch just, uh, se the second season of Glitch just got onto Netflix. That's uh, like a semi sci fi drama show about like dead people coming back to life. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, and one of, and it's like this cop who discovers them, and one of the people who comes back to life is his uh, is his former wife. Um, oh. And he's remarried, and they're pregnant. Um, oh, jeez. Yeah. Uh, uh, did, did 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 you watch the uh, the 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 Future Man, the Hulu uh, Future Man? I watched the first episode. It was pretty funny. Uh, I, I I don't I I I, I might go back and, and check out some of the other episodes sometimes time but it's pretty good yeah you know I, I the things that i liked about it is that at at times it reveals itself to be kind of a smarter show than you think it's going to be mm -hmm. but i also really i was kind of uh uh, uh you know uh, not not set against it but uh kind of got me thinking i 
we had a game night on Saturday, and somebody at the end of the night wound up turning on a speed running documentary about like the oh. first, the like pre YouTube speed running of Mario sixty four. Oh, cool! And, and like how that evolved from like okay, well you figure out this one glitch, and then somebody on a message board figures out another glitch, and then somebody figures out. So basically going from like initially it was like the fastest way you could do it was 74 stars and then it was 50 stars and then eventually it became one star, right? Yeah. And uh, I guess I kind of wanted the video, not not that I should be speaking to like video game purity on any level. Uh -huh. Like he winds up beating the game in just kind of a very sort of like, oh, I just beat the game nobody's beat the game because the game's too hard but it's like i would have kind of loved it if, if there was some like Seems different like... yeah some yeah. some kind of uh uh something that said something a little bit more about the character other than like oh this guy loves this thing and now he's now he's beaten it because well you know we got to get this plot moving <laughs> do you remember the wait name uh, of it? Are, you, are you talking about future man no. i am yeah oh wait Wait, are we thought I thought you wait, is this a part of Future Man? It's no, the well, opening the, the, scene. The, the, yeah, the yeah, the plot gets kicking when he beats this oh, game. Oh, I thought I for some reason thought you were still talking about that speed run. No, no, no. Yeah. So, so I, I, uh, Brian, what, what you missed was that uh, the night before I started watching Future, you recommended Future Man to me. I watched this documentary about speed running and and kind of like how so basically like in in a pre-YouTube world how did people, it was like these, just these forums where people were like, oh, I can beat it doing this and I can beat it doing that. And like, and then even at that point, like, like, all the stuff is unverified because it's just people saying that they timed themselves, which the tricks wound up working. They were verifiable, but like the initial person who posted the thing doesn't have any proof because, right. you know, just somebody recording it in like real media player and posting it uh, eventually later on. But anyway, so yeah, I, I just, uh, uh, Future Man, I, I really, I really liked it, and and the jokes are funny. Uh, the characters are really well done, and it's kind of very much overcast, uh, uh, considering what it is. But like, uh, there's like just it's like one of those shows where it's like I, I, I like ninety percent can wrap my hands around the characters, but like there's still these like little moments where I'm like, like oh okay. Welcome to Justin Trash's Brian's Picks. No, I liked no. it. Ashley really liked it, too. Welcome to Justin Trash's Brian's Picks. <laughs> Let me no, my wife liked it. Yeah. <laughs> I know, I liked it. Yeah. I said I liked it. I, I, oh, liked I said it. I liked it. <laughs> um, gentlemen, uh, Bryce, you said we had a letter? Yes, I am. I just remembered I'm forwarding it to you now. Sweet. Now we talked about before about the idea of talking about our, our, our leveling up resolutions and we were gonna I think we we're gonna do that next week, the eleventh. That works for me. Uh sure. Instead of, you know, doing New Year's resolutions, we're gonna do, you know, December eleventh resolutions. Because it's original. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes. <laughs> yes. <The pain>. Yes. <laughs> Your resolutions oh. must be more severe. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, I'm good to go. If you the like. thing about 17th century mercantilism. <laughs> do we uh do we have a topic figured out for this? After oh, this is great. No, I'm gonna lead with this. This is a good one. This is a good one. Okay, this is good, great, good. Bob, Bob Walters. All right, ready? Yep, yep. Take it away in three, two. Welcome to the After Things podcast. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Justin Robert Young. That is me, Brian Brushwood. It's so good to be here with the two of you. On and After Things. We're produced by Mr. Bryce Castillo. Hi, guys. 
Huzzah. There are two L's, but you don't pronounce them. You just no, say they're silent. L. They're should should be like a Y. But it's okay. I'm not judging whoever named you. <laughs> okay, good. Um, <laughs> gentlemen, we yes. got an email, and uh, Brian, right before the show, moments before the show. Although we have, we go through lengthy discussions and preparation meetings, lots of you know conferences and things like this. We have entire documents planning to what we're going to do. Every now and then, we just throw it out the window because we get a question that comes up. And we're like, you know what? Let's address this. Yep. I know we did a off-site retreat to discuss what we were going to talk about for the show today, yep. but this is more important. You ready? Yeah. From Bob Walters. Hello. I have a question for After Things. That's us. So I'm a firm believer in the idea of having several irons in the fire, but unfortunately, many of my projects also require some sort of social media presence. Long story short, I'm currently juggling five Twitter accounts and four Facebook pages, and I fear none are getting all the attention I deserve. I can't afford to hire someone to manage some of them, and I don't want to drop an entire project just because I can't keep up with the social media component. How do you guys handle all your social media accounts? Do you have any tips for maximizing the effectiveness of your posts so you can get the most mileage out of them? Do you have any advice for automating posts, uh, automatically posting when you publish an episode, et cetera? Thanks, guys, and good luck with your own projects. It's a great question because I consider myself a complete failure at this. Oh, wait, what do you mean? Why, why label the failure? Uh, I mean, I because keep, I mean, keep, keep, keep in mind you have a you have a sizable audience and you go live on Periscope on the regular. You are good about following through and responding to everyone. As far as I, as far as I know, you don't have five other accounts dying on the vine, do you? I mean, they died a while ago. Oh, so, great! <laughs> yeah, it, you're a success at culling quickly. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you. An exam and I'm gonna give you a historical example, which is kind of interesting. You ever and, and, and it relates to this, I swear. You're familiar with the bent pyramid, right? The bent pyramid, right? This pyramid that goes like this and then it goes like this, right? Hmm. I've I've oh, I don't it's think great. I've heard yeah, of Bryce, this. you pull up an image of the bent pyramid, because like the Egyptians, you know, like building like these sort of like, you know, pyramid shaped objects was something that was tried around the world. Because like, hey, you know what's cool? Like big things that we build. We can build big things. Cause you know, so you look at the bent pyramid, right? Oh, it looks like they were very ambitious in the beginning and then just realized, hey, man, we got to wrap this up or or it's going to be an incomplete pyramid forever. So they just sort yeah, of... Yeah, the angle was wrong. Now, if you look at the final angle the bit pyramid ended at is pretty much the angle that other pyramids from henceforth were made at. So they started at a very steep angle. Like this thing was going to be, would have been amazing, but like, ah, it kind of collapsed on itself, kind of like fell in, like... Oh, you know, there's a there's, you know, without mortar or interior structures, there's kind of a shape that you can't really beat when it comes to just laying rocks on top of each other. And they looked at that top shape like, you know what, let's let's just build a pyramid at that angle. OK. Um, and so basically it sort of affected the design of pyramids, you know, from henceforth on in. And then so you let things sort of collapse and then you see the pattern of which they form for me. You know, like, yeah, I would love to be ambitious. And, and I, I tried Hootsuite and these other things. We're doing social media posts and stuff. Granted, I could use a tool that would post, like, weird things, podcasts out there. There's a couple times where I think I should be like, hey, automatically tell people, you know, hey, this is what I'm up to. But I hate, hate, hate posts from people that are automatic posts. When I'm on, I don't hardly go into Facebook, but if I see so-and-so from Twitter posted this and they don't respond to a single thing and their Facebook thing, I'm kind of like, F you. You know, you're just, yeah. you're, you're just advertising here, you know? And I go into Facebook and I'll say like, hey, I got a new book out, whatever. But I don't, if I'm putting a thought-provoking comment there or something from some other media, then I'm going to stick around and talk about it. Yeah, um, man, I got to tell you, um, I don't think we, I, I, I do want to hear uh, about the, the genesis and death of previous accounts, uh, on your end, Andrew, but, um, part of it f is fueled by my frustration for the business model of Facebook, but it's been kind of a year and I've just given up on Facebook. I think I've made three posts in the last year and I've realized yeah. like where I'm white hot is, uh, is on Twitter. That's what Sat is is most complementary to my natural set of talents, which is speaking free form and having live discussions and trying to respond politically, you know, asking charged questions and then engaging in hopefully a fun and interesting way. Um, 
I, uh, I, 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 I don't know that there's a lot of value of being, you know, not very interesting on five accounts as at once versus just be interesting on one account. I hardly agree. Justin, what's your hot take? I forget where I heard it over the weekend or maybe it was over the holiday. Somebody said, you know, your fans don't follow you. You follow your fans. Right. And it, it, it was like something that made me think that when it comes to like this, like, why do you have five social media accounts? Theoretically, it's because people identify with this one strand of your life. Right. Or this one project that you're doing. And they only want that to the point where they they want to exclude anything else you talk about. Right. So if somebody likes me and they just want to hear my random opinions, but they don't want any ads for the contender, but maybe they do want ads for or they, they want to know when a new stickers or DIF thing is out. Right. Like, I think ultimately, if there is not a desire a measurable desire from your community to have something separate, then there is no point in having something separate. Uh, I, yeah, I, I don't do Facebook. I hardly ever like Brian. I hardly ever do Facebook. And, and I understand it's a very important part of a lot of people's lives. It is the glue. It's a way they connect and they do that. I understand that. But if that's not a thing you need, if it's not a thing that's useful to you, if it's a time waste, which is what it is for me, you don't want to spend time there. I don't want to go in there. It's very easy for me to go into and also because, you know, hey, I have a th I have this great con I have this great topic I put on Facebook and great, there's a big, long conversation there. Like, you know, one, you tend to ignore it, not care. Two, it's just so what? You know, I, I like to do Twitter, pop something in there, say something, respond to something. At, look, I try to respond to every at reply that I get on there. I do my best to do that. And I try every other day or so. I try to be there every day when I can. And it's very easy to control. But I, we've gone off on our, our opinion on the problem with Facebook. And the problem with Facebook is why Facebook is so successful because it's so effective at capturing your attention. It is one of these things where I talk to friends who are like, oh, no, I'm into Facebook. And I'm like, let's talk about your productivity. And then they'll, you know, I kind of do this sort of like, let's do this Facebook detox. You tell me how much you're really using it and tell me how much you're defending it versus how productive you are. And the people often have a reckoning. They're like, oh, wow, I didn't realize. I didn't realize this. And, and I, the problem I have is like every time I work with another organization, a publisher or TV network, whatever, their social media department's like, we need to do this on Facebook and this on Facebook because Facebook has sold them on the idea of how you know they need these tools and do these things. And some people are effective at it, and they think that that's going to apply to everybody. And I'm like, well, I'm a Twitter guy. Like, oh, well, we think this works over here. I'm like, I'm a Twitter guy. You know, I have people who tell me they get Twitter accounts to follow me, you know, so that's working for me and it's my best thing. And, you know, I do, you know, I would the problem, like I would do uh, Periscope. I love it. But I would go do Facebook Live because I know the people who I'm working with, my professional partners, they only pay attention to Facebook because that's their own bubble. And they have no idea what I'm doing outside that bubble, which is problematic because and I would do Facebook stuff just so they think, oh, Andrew is doing stuff. And I'm like, you have no idea what I'm doing in social media, you know. So it's frustrating. Yeah, uh, and and I, I uh, Bryce brings up a good point in the chat, which is like, well, you, the whole point of outreach is to go to where the the people who haven't yet figured out that you're their fans yet are right. And and mm -hmm. I will freely admit that if I was in a perfect world, in a perfect world, yes, for each of your five separate projects, there should be five distinct brand voices and five distinct avenues to reach out through social media through each of those. However, that, as we're seeing in this email, butts up against the fact that you are a single human being who doesn't have an infinite amount of time, energy, and effort. And if that is going to be the case, I feel like you're better off playing to your strengths than trying to do everything half-assed. I'm going to also make an argument here, too, that... When it comes to virility, I think that there are certain things that make, you know, longer form stuff. If you, you know, like we're watching me, me too works pretty well on Facebook for longer stories, but so many of the stories that we talk about here are things on Twitter and it's fun to disparage Twitter. Like, Oh, Twitter's dead. Twitter's this. Meanwhile, I hear what so-and-so said on Twitter and it's hilarious because you see this is like this. It is the chosen medium 
of the president of the United States, for better or for worse, and it's a conversation every single day. And you can say, well, if I'm not on Facebook, yeah, but somebody you know is. Somebody you know who follows you is on there. And if it's worth making it, if it's really worth one human telling another human out there, it's going to get out there. You know, I called up Brian Friday night. Oh, my God. Look, at see what Elon Musk said. You know, I'm telling everybody this stuff because Elon Musk on Twitter, it's easy to follow, very easy to follow through. And I don't get stuck in the friggin molasses fire of Facebook by going in there. I think it's I think one outlet is highly effective. GD, a man became president by tweets. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And, and, you know, oh, you know, if he had more Facebook outreach, like, you know, the $50,000 the Russians spent on ads, please shut up. Okay. That it was his own steam, his own momentum that got his, and his the ability to create outrage, whatever you want to do. I'm just saying that well, we and, talked and, about him because of the things he by said. By the way, uh, you know, let's, let's go ahead, let's go ahead and, and make uh, uh, President Trump a model of the efficacy. I didn't say any names. No, no, no. Okay, that's fine. I will. I will. An um, unnamed president. Re- regardless, regardless of, of uh, how you feel about the president, let's evaluate how he used Twitter to get him the edge. Like, let's go ahead and attribute his presidency to being on Twitter. Uh, what did he do? Things he did not do. Ever use scheduled tweets. Ever use banal uh, quotes uh, that, that that you dug out of a... Of, of, of a you know, brainyquote.com. Yes, exactly. Right. And, you know, look at me. I'm engaging. I said something. No, he spoke from the gut, from the from the heart uh, and, and, and from his soul uh, for good or for ill. He invoked a passionate response of people, positive and negative, And yet ultimately he captured attentions. Uh, and, and this goes back to, uh, you know, a, a friend of mine. Nate Staniforth, uh, his book comes out next ne- next month, and I think we talked about this, where uh, I'm doing my best to help him to uh, uh, get a lot of pre-orders because that is very, very important going into the launch of the book, especially if you want to have any chance of showing up on any kind of list. And, um, you know, Nate has worked on his craft and his product for the last two or three years, and yet it was this flash for him where he was like, holy shit, Brian, uh, it seems like one of the most valuable resources you could have is the attention of other people. And uh, and, and I think he's 100% right. And it doesn't matter if it's good attention or bad attention. And I know this is cliche to say, and I know it makes our skin crawl when we think of some bad attention that people generate, but uh, authenticity and directness and availability will do more to, to uh, in, uh, instigate engagement than just about anything else you know and, and we live in an environment where we don't trust the media and i'm going to say rightfully so any media whatever right left wing whatever we don't trust it because everybody has an agenda we don't trust it they're inauthentic they say things to support their own cause when somebody says something we feel is real you know that resonates you know and to other, some of us might be like yeah that's real and i don't like that what they said that scares me that's irrelevant to how that affects other people real We've we've watched, you know, in, in politics, we've watched campaign after campaign like, oh, so and so's killing on social media. It's like there are five people writing his tweets you know, for other people, you know, for campaigns. It's like, I don't know who the person is. I have no idea. I know there's a team putting this there and the team to get them elected isn't the same team that runs things and everything feels inauthentic. And then we're watching in this whole, you know, media breakdown of of personalities and stuff of people who professed values that they don't have. You know, and just everything feels inauthentic. So somebody who speaks seems real. I think authenticity is like, yeah, authenticity. Like I've had, I've tried to tell people I work with my publishers, like the most effective tool I've had has been Periscope, you know, and I get people all the time on Periscope, like, oh my God, you're real. You're real. Like you're just a guy and a cat talking to us. I'm like, yeah, I'm not like, you know, I'm not putting these inspirational quotes and crap like this. And, you know, that's, you know, that stupid self media posturing that people do that just makes my skin crawl because it gets to be so fake and that killing it mentality. You know, I just, you know, I just want to be a real person because, you know what? I don't know. I've got my quirks, but I like people. I'm likable enough <laughs> in small doses. <laughs> so uh, what, yeah, I, what I, about I, I think yeah. here's here's the biggest thing is that ultimately 
sure, you you it it seems in its own way counterintuitive to double down on what you're doing and double down on what's working and then feed everything else from that. But while you want outreach to be the capturing of new eyeballs, the best way to capture new eyeballs is by uh, like having the, the 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 closer you are to qualified audience and you are closer to a larger qualified audience if other people who already like you are retweeting you or replying to you like that's that's social proof that proves authenticity right mm -hmm. if you see people going uh, a, a back and forth and i think that's what both of you guys have done with with spectacular effect but and it's it's getting it's getting the people who follow me or to tell their friends, oh, check this book out, read this book by this guy, you'll like it. It's not like, oh, I read this most amazing medium post by this author, now I'm going to read his book. It's no, somebody who read the thing, you know, and and maybe I, had you know a choice to read a bunch of things, and then said, oh, I engaged with him, he was kind of interesting, or I saw this thing, he did, I read it, now I'm going to tell other people to go do this thing. You know, I think that's. Word of mouth is still the most important form of currency there is. And you would get higher degrees of, you know, you, it, the more authentic you are with the people you're talking or the more engaged they are, the better that gets. So do, do you guys have advice specific for Bob? Because Bob, Bob's issue is that he's got too many pages. And let, let's say consolidation in, and, and merging some of these is, is, is not uh, the first option here, right? Like, Do we, do we know... And I guess the question, I mean, the answer is, so, you know, he's got five projects, right? So is he juggling five for, for five separate projects? And I think that, yeah, the problem is, is he knows what the problem is. He's trying to do too many things. I deal with this. You know, I couldn't sleep last night. I woke up late because I've got, you know, I've been, I've had this wonderful situation where I've, I've had people say yes to things I never thought they would say yes to. And now I'm committed, you know, overcommitted you know, beyond belief right now. And it's good. And I'll figure out how to make it work. But I focused on one thing, you know, I, fo I focused on two things. Like my, my life became six years ago. There were two driving forces. You know, I was paying the bills, doing like regular routine, put out magic products, working with Justin and I tricks. That was just sort of clock in clock out on that. Then it was take meetings to go pitch TV shows. And then it was books. You know, I had three things that were taking up my time. But one was I wasn't trying to grow the magic business. That was it. The TV thing was, you know, every few weeks I might go do something on that. The rest of it was writing, writing, writing. Writing was the primary focus. TV dictated my schedule. Writing dictated my time. So and I doubled I, down on that. I guess I guess that's the larger question. And I'd be curious because I, I feel like you and I, uh, Andrew, have already kind of been through the ringer. We've seen projects get launched. Um, you know, you've got the initial excitement phase, and then based on how far it goes, it sort of enters this uh, sleepy harvest phase where however far it got is how far it's going to go until you start injecting a lot of energy in it. And it becomes kind of like, well, this is a decent moneymaker for what it is. We'll just let it kind of run its course. Um, and it sounds to me like it might be that kind of situation here where uh, an expectation of keeping the brand alive is keeping up the regular maintenance by doing some kind of regular posts on social media or whatever. But I'd be curious to hear uh, Justin's take on this. Um, do you feel like, Justin, that the answer is, well, just inject a lot of electricity in there, a lot of energy, and then it'll it'll blow back up? Or do you feel like when when something's not a grand slam home run, when something's not going supernova, uh, but it's generating some level of interest income or whatever, how much energy do you devote to it? And and is there a moment that you declare, I'm better off cutting this off and stopping it? Well, I think that if you're like, oh, okay, well I've set up five different accounts and I'm uh, I'm having a hard time making them worth it. I'm going to assume based on his email that the reason why he assumes or that he's saying that things could be better is because he's not getting the engagement that he would want. And I think that that's life telling him he's doing too much. Like that's yeah. if, if you can't fit all the stuff that you're doing into the place where you are talking to the most people, then think about your resource allocation. You know, the, the only uh, uh, extra Twitter accounts that I have 
and Facebook accounts are for the contender. Because as much as I can always plug the contender on my podcast stuff, that is, it, it's, it's hard to serve two masters if I'm selling stickers and I'm also selling the game, right? Like that's, that's uh, I think, just a, a lot. It, 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 it's, it's a lot to focus on and kind of makes things a little bit challenging. But even then, I've just made a decision on the contender account that, look, when we got stuff, we'll, we'll tweet it. Right. You know, if, if, if I ever wanted to take that brand and make it something more than just the card game. Right. Or, or you know, the, the card games, then I would think about doing more with it. But for right now, it's literally just to let everybody who likes that game know new stuff is here and we'll yeah, tweet it a couple times and, and that'll be it. And that's that's a very I mean, that's a point where, you know, when you have something has its own momentum, then you spin it off into its own thing. And, and, and you know, that that has a life of its own and, and it's worth being its own thing. We do that. You know, I tricks was yeah. our magic news site and still is. And that's a thing that was separate from my brand because I wanted this thing to function without me. And it started off, you know, just just in working on this thing. And, you know, that was going to be separate. It was never going to be Andrew Main Incorporated with iTrix. It was just, hey, here's a project. I'm working on this with Justin. It's a separate thing. And it lives and dies by that. I think that, you know, when you're trying to manage five things, you know, I have a friend that used to say this, which it's 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 imprecise, but it still is helpful. And he says, like, you know, if you have a if you have a 150 IQ and you're trying to do two things at once, you get 50, 75 IQ points on each thing, you know, which, you know, it's like well, we know it's not literally true, but it is in a way it feels that way. And if you're trying to come up with the best ideas you can for something, there's a time when you say, I've done, I have some projects that I pick up because I've done everything I can on this other thing. And if I keep putting more time on it, I'm just going to drive my myself nuts and everybody else around me. I need to go do something else. It's why I picked up coding. Cause I'm like, I can just sit in front of my computer and code for hours and take my mind out. You know, that's my break from other stuff. But you know, if you're, not nothing's getting traction. If nothing's getting traction, focus on one thing. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a good way to put it. Like if you if if stuff looks like it's stalled out, then you know, focus on where you have momentum. Focus on yeah. where you have a voice. Yeah, and I mean it, it can be you know, it's in the Scott Adams, I I loved what he said in his book was I forget the name of the you know, like how to fail at everything or whatever, but uh how to fail at everything and still win big. Well, yeah, it's specifically about energy versus passion. Yes. And and what's interesting is he also talks about um, the inverse of what you were just saying is like focusing on two different things. You divert half, you know, your attention at any given time, uh, whereas he talks about like being able to do two things. It's better to do two things good than one thing excellent. Right. Uh, which is the inverse, because. Being able to do two things good or being t good at two things at the same time Which doesn't skills. require yes skills doesn't require any more energy like like for me to for me to uh, fix a toilet while also speaking Spanish doesn't require is different from me from running a Spanish blog and then separately running a plumbing blog does that make sense yeah 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 and like and it's and we saw that we you know Brian and I saw this in Magic where we're like you know. There's a there's a method called the double lift. We don't need to get into it. Like, man, you can learn fifth. You can spend a lifetime perfecting that. Yep. Do you know how many more shows you're going to get once you move beyond, you know, you know, a <laughs> week's worth of good effort on that? Yeah. Zero. Zero. But for many magicians, it becomes the thing they want to focus on because business stresses them out. Everything else stresses them out, but they can work on a move. I can just go on a move, and I don't have to deal with everything else. It's like playing a video game. Nothing wrong with it, and you could justify it however you want. It ain't gonna help in yeah. the long, in the grand scheme of things. And I get into discussion with people like, you know, like oh, I'm working on this. I'm like, what is your? If your goal is to perfect the technique, then that's wonderful. I think that's a beautiful thing. But when their conversations are always about getting more shows and audiences, it's like. You know, I could I could go to a lighting convention and study spotlights and figure out the perfect light, the perfect natural tone and microphones and things like this. And ain't going to make my show any better, you know, than an appreciable. It's a law of diminishing returns. Yes. And diminishing returns is a good way to put it, because uh, what will happen is, is you'll you'll get higher and higher in a in this strange tournament where there's fewer and fewer competitors. And now the rewards become not that you get booked. You go from nothing to 
a, a weekly close-up gig at a steakhouse or the next phase from the steakhouse to, you know, doing a corporate show or whatever. But now it's like at the very high end of that tournament, you'll you'll look at seven magic forums and in two of them, you'll find one post in which somebody says your double lift is better than this other guy's double lift and you'll and you'll fist pump alone in your office to to no additional dollar signs. Yeah, or you know, get like, well, you know, if you win the world such and such magic competition today, I got work. Like, yeah, that's a dumb game to play if you're trying to get work. The amount of effort and hours, the amount of hours wasted by magicians trying to win those competitions for the goal of getting work. Like, I say this about America's Got Talent shows like that. Like, ah, I want to go do America. I'm like, listen, if for if you count all of the magicians that have tried and all the time they spent on it. It's a waste of time. Statistically speaking, it's a complete waste of time. If you say, you know, hey, I want to spend the next six months, I'm willing to put whatever I can and, and knowing that like, oh, yeah, I'm going to have to probably shell out 10, 20 grand if I'm a magician to really, you know, get my stuff up. If you want to spend the money and spend the time doing it, better strategies. They're better strategies. So anyhow, you know, it's it comes back to what we talk about. Focus. It's focus. And if you can't do five things well – that's, you know, like you said, that's the Brent pyramid. It's not working. Now, you can take something, pick one thing, succeed, bring on a partner or somebody to run that for you. You know, Elon Musk does, he's got a space company, he's got a rocket company, he's got a tunnel company, he's got a Hyperloop company, he's got these companies. Why? Because he's got the money to hire the best brains there are. A big part of his time is spent finding people to work for him. You know, I've met people who've been his recruiters. I met the guy that was one of the early recruiters for Tesla. I met another guy like he's got some of those amazing people in the world finding the best brains because he knows he can have a crazy idea. Go talk to four or five people to go. Yeah, I think it'll make it work. Great. It's a thing now. It's a company. And boom, it's done. I don't have that, you know. So I got to limit myself to I'm going to write a book. You know, I'm going to pitch a TV show. Yeah. I mean, uh, 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 they're. Hardest thing you're ever going to do ever, I think, if you're a self-starter, is shutting things down or mm -hmm. distancing yourself or understanding that they need to take a different part of your brain. You know, it's it's hard because you wrap up your your emotions in it and uh, they, they're they, it, it's it's rough. You know, it, it's, it's rough with podcasting, you know, so to do. Shut I'll, something down. I'll say this much. You know, the the one line that stands out to me from Bob is, long story short, I'm currently juggling five Twitter accounts and four Facebook pages, and I fear none are getting the attention I deserve. I'm going to suggest this. Uh, if you would not read and follow these accounts, just don't even bother to invest one second into any of them. If you're just churning out the same garbage new episode out or or you know uh, version 2.5 coming soon or uh retweeting a compliment saying thank you like those are fine as part of a larger strategy but if you essentially have nothing to say that will cause somebody to get upset or to bring joy to their life or to do anything substantive in the day-to-day -day life of other people that has nothing to do with your product i think you're better off not even bothering or at least limiting the amount of, of, of well, barking I, I, you do on there. I, I, I do think that new product, like just super dry, new product added, blank. Like, like we have an update. Here it is. Like, I think that those kind of things are valuable. Like, because I, I, to me, I would rather have that where I just know that it is this utilitarian thing. I mean, I think that there's, it wouldn't be the craziest thing in the world if you had, you have enough people that are dedicated to the scam stuff brand to just have a new product alert thing that is effectively just a, drop of whenever there's a new thing here you go there's you know there's a new thing it doesn't always have to be out of your voice there will always be an audience for you talking about it in your voice but i do think that if it's mechanical let it be mechanical that's fine but like at least give yourself that gift of oh how do i make this something special or grand or whatever like just let that be its own rss feed that just says new thing you're done at least you save that mental capacity of like Okay, that's out. The people that care about it enough will find it. People that don't won't. And I can now focus on my own thing. And part of it is 
you know, something that's hard to know what to do, but in delayed gratification is, is, is a challenge. And I'm a person that's never been able to deal well with it. I've always liked projects I can quickly turn around, but I've had a long conversation with a friend who, you know, is an author who does other projects and was working on some other sort of thing. And, and I've had, well, what about this book thing? What about, the, and it's, and it's reflections of the conversations I've had with Justin, but I'm playing a different role, you know, and, and, and I've seen where people are like, well, I got this, I'm trying to do this because of this. And I'm like, well, remember when I did this thing? Cause I thought that was my thing. What saved my ass later on? It was the writing. It was the writing. It was the thing I focused on. That was the one had the, the most immediate reaction to as I hit the microphone every time I make my point, you know, what was the thing the world said? Yes, this is what we want more of. And that's the thing to sometimes focus on, but you sometimes don't know, you don't know what it will be, but if you put, I'm reaping the benefits right now of efforts I put in two years ago. You know, and and then and not just in and other stuff we'll be able to talk a little bit more about where groundwork I put in several years ago now has come through with, you know, credibility and whatever to be able to do things that if I said, oh, I want to do this five years ago, I'd be like, that's crazy. You'll never nobody will let you do that now. You know, things pay off. It's hard. It's hard. It's just working in a vacuum and nobody's paying attention and it's just keeping at it. But uh, yeah, side side note on all that, like uh, if you if you ever doubt just believe, believe in the snowball. Snowball's a real effect. It really does get easier farther down the hill, but at some point you have to start. You have to start, and you'll feel silly. Who are you at the top of the mountain rolling this this little, you know, grapefruit-sized thing forward? Just trust trust that eventually it gets really interesting. Yeah. And if you have the energy for it and you keep doing it, you know, it works. It's easy to do a lot of things. It's easy, you know, anybody can pick up coding. Anybody can open up a social media account. Anybody can do that. But to keep at it and to make it work, it's the same as it's always been. It takes work. You know, when when they when the the electronic, you know, word processor came out, you know, was like, "Now everybody's going to become a novelist." Didn't happen. It didn't happen. You know, it made it easier for a lot of people. But if you had the stamina to sit your way through 80 or 90,000 words, you probably could have figured out how to buy a typewriter. You know, the hard part wasn't having a thing in front of you. It lowered the cost of it. But at the end of the day, the determination when the digital video, everybody's going to become a filmmaker. Do we have a greater are there, you know, is the talent ratio better? I don't know. Like, I think a lot of film schools are filmed with a lot of untalented people who just some film school, some school's great, whatever, and it's a mixed ratio of but people like, ah, I have this equipment, so I'm a filmmaker. Like, yeah, it, no. it, it doesn't matter how many gizmos come out. There's only so, uh, there, there is a measurable amount of talent in the talent pool, and there's a measurable amount of attention in the consumer pool. And, yeah. and, and it's like, and the stuff in between is just a matter of fidelity. And I would I would make the argument what it does do is it does help people at the lower end of the economic spectrum is that is that if somebody who there is like, yeah, mom and dad aren't going to fund me two hundred thousand dollars to make my film, but I can make it for this. And we saw some we've seen cases like this where people who wouldn't have necessarily had the same opportunities that people who came from sort of like I think it, it's become it's it's increased the talent pool yep. by letting other people have access to it at the expense of people that were able to get into it just because their parents or somebody already had resources. Agreed. So it takes work. It takes yes. work. I got to, uh, I got a pick. Pick. I already mentioned it and uh, full disclosure, you're going to hear me mention it a lot over the next month and a half. Uh, that is your friend of mine, Nate Staniforth's book. Here is real magic. It's available for pre-order right now. Uh, we are oh, beautiful cover. Beautiful cover. Uh, oh, it's great. It's great. And 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 the 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 whole book just uh is in one way it's it's the hobbit. It's it's the, uh there and back, you know. It's like you you get in a place, you get disaffected with it, you go out into the big wide world and you come back and see it differently. Um but it's true and it's a real story and it matters to me that I was there as a friend when I watched him announce, "Hey, I'm going to India. I'm going to go try this thing. It's going to be insane." Bye. And then he came back and so on. And um, we recorded a half hour interview with him that hopefully will be going out this uh, Thursday or Friday of this week uh, on the Scam School channel. So that's youtube.com slash Scam School. But um, Nate has an ability to strip away all of the BS of so many different things and present just the essence of wonder 
uh, in and of itself, and and just just to just to remove all of the nonsense in between is just I don't know it's it's, it's wonderful, and uh, I'm a big fan of the book. We're looking at the trailer right now. If you search Nate Staniforth, you'll be able to see it, or we're going to have it at the uh, at the beginning of this interview coming up later this week as well. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Yeah, Dave, he's he's always been very passionate. Very very always had a deeper sort of look at this, which uh, yeah, I've always sort of felt like man. <laughs> should have chosen a bigger art than magic <laughs> <laughs> well but 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 i think that's one of the things that i adore about nate is that is that and he talks about this in his book um he's always going to be that seven-year-old kid who saw the milky way for the first time and magic is the vehicle by which he wants to bring that experience to everybody uh, at all of his shows and uh, here's real magic reminds me a lot of that letter that teller wrote to me 20 years ago where please stop writing to me uh, yeah, yes, give or take. Um, where, where uh, you know, it's it's yes, the MacGuffin is magic, but it's really about what it means to love what you do, and then to love it so much and work so closely with it that you become briefly disillusioned with it. And it's about one artisan's uh, quest to recapture that that magic and wonder. Sweet. Uh, uh, yeah, I don't really have another pick. I don't know if I have another pick. Uh, Catacombs uh, and kobolds. Uh, or, or I, the... I, I, I double down. I, Nate, Nate's a cool guy. Go buy his book. Uh, I, I may have mentioned this, and I don't know how much of it holds up. I don't know how much of this holds up, but when I read it, it had a big impact on me. That was Maxwell Maltz's book, Psycho Cybernetics. Oh, and, wow. That's, that's an old one, huh? But it kept getting brought back. It was a big pop psychology book, probably one of the ones that sort of launched the pop psychology movement. But any uh, uh, Maxwell Maltz was a originally was trained like as a plastic surgeon and found that doing small little things on some people dramatically improved their self image. Sometimes doing drastic things and other people didn't do enough, you know, that, that didn't change how they perceive themselves. But the idea of developing the idea of the sense of self and how to be more productive, how to be more at peace with yourself. I would say if there was one book that impacted me that helped me get over my, you know, a lot of my insecurities, et cetera, it was that book. Again, not read it in years, but it's one of these things people like. I'm like, you know what? This was the book that, you know, sort of changed my perception on stuff. So uh, the book went on to become a huge hit, launched an entire sort of franchise and empire, and it had they had a bunch of spurless sort of books like Psycho Cybernetics in the Stock Market and other kinds of stuff. But yeah, when Maxwell Maltz passed away, he left behind a mass fortune, and it actually ended up founding at Nova Southeastern University, not too far from where Justin and I had lived. Mm -hmm. Big building there, the Maxwell Maltz building. So, oh wow, you know. Um, but anyhow, that's the thing. If you ever want to get into like, hey, I don't know, my self image kind of thing, like take a look at it because it was just he was a guy who learned one of the pioneers in like what does plastic surgery have to do with it? It's like. It gets into the idea of how we see ourselves, how we think the world, if our physical perception of ourselves is sort of starts from. But, you know, so much of how we think about people is irrelevant to that. But it gets in. It's deeper than that. And I'm not doing it justice. But anyhow, right on. Pick. Gentlemen, it's been after. Indeed, it has. Hey, Bryce, uh, yes. I just realized I don't think I watched this last week's Mr. Robot. OK, I got to run. All right, all right, bye, Andrew. All right, bye, Andrew. Bye. Uh, okay. Do Do we have anything else on the? I'm wondering. I haven't looked at the page today. Yeah. Um, okay. Do, uh, I mean, you. Yeah, I think I'll try to watch it. To watch it. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, um, and I mean this in a, a good way because he's diligent and on time and knows where to find me. Um, what in my mind is budgeted as preparing for court killers time uh, is oftentimes when David Rowan shows up with like, these are currently on fire. Will you please put out these fires? Sure. <laughs> so we'll see. We'll see if I'm able to. <laughs> yeah, I'd say speak right. in if you can. Bye, okay. Justin. Bye, bud. Yeah, I'd say try I did. I did watch De Deadwood Gambling Man. Actually, um, actually, I think it would. This is. I think this is a. Well, I think this is Pretty a well liked one. episode of Mr. Robot. I don't like it, which is why I think it's divisive. Okay. Um, so I think if you have that within you. Uh, okay. I will. I will endeavor to make time for that. Um, uh, 
Uh, but that's coming up in more than two hours. So, everybody, thank you for watching. We will uh, catch you then. Bye. Feel that timing was perfect. <laughs>